back here with my good friend Costas Mandalore at Comic Con Liverpool with Monopoly events. Costas, you've had a long line of excited Saw fans all weekend. It must be amazing geeking out with the Saw fans again. Yeah. Um, look, uh, in all sincerity, without being too precious, this is just seeing people smile and have fun and enjoy the fantasy land of movie making and comic books and all these kinds of things is uh, a pleasure to see. The last time we spoke, that got a lot of fans talking online. There's even been other horror channels deciphering our interview, trying to understand, first of all, what your idea would be for a direct sequel to Saw 7 that you mentioned. You, ha you said that you have that idea up your sleeve that you weren't prepared to tell me what that was. Sort of the gist of it would be you going after Dr. Gordon's character, yeah. you surviving the end of Saw 7. Do you think we could see it at some point? If you had to say yes or no right now, do you, you think know, we could see it? I can only be in, uh, I can only get in trouble with the producers because <laughs> they have their own ideas and they're very good and they proved that they've regenerated this series again as of last year with Saw X. Um, I, I really do have a scene that I will share with them that would be a way for me to start chasing Dr. Gordon. And if they ever did that, I, it would be an honor and a pleasure to be a part of it because so many journeys and characters and so many twists and turns if it ever ends it should end on a great great note and it'll be up to them but I will open my mouth at some point and uh, they're all smart enough to have made it this far without me but if they listen to me it might be great so I'll try because like you mentioned you've got those two contrasting timelines that people want to see people are greedy I'm greedy I want to see both those stories explored the ending to Saw 10 you know that was the massive twist at the end right. where you were revealed people want to see a direct sequel to that but they also want to see a direct sequel to Saw 7 so it seemed like next up will be the direct sequel to Saw 10 Saw 11 everyone wants to see you back in Saw 11 well, I've heard, I've heard a lot of fans, and thank God for the fans, because they are the barometer, you know, in the cinema and after, in the aftermath. They tell you things, and they get online and do whatnot. And I know the producers are smart enough to listen to the fans, but apparently when I came in at the end of Saw X, a lot of people in a lot of cinemas went, Wah! so that's good for me, and thank you. But the boys at the top have to make the decision of what they're going to do. And I've been sworn to secrecy, but... You can only pray for an extra shot, you know what I mean? So we'll see what happens. You know, when you look back now, when your character was initially brought in Saw 3, I'm correct? Yeah. So Saw 3, I guess you wouldn't have even imagined that you would be appearing in the 10th Saw all these years later and that you would have become the successor to Jigsaw and everything like that and survived as long as you did. Were there times where you thought your character wasn't going to make it? Were there early scripts for Saw 5, Saw 6 where your character was going to get killed? I never thought I would make it and I never thought I wouldn't make it. I just tried to stay in the zone on every movie to not screw up and force them to kill me. <laughs> uh, so I behaved myself very well and uh, I guess I'm still alive. And the, it's, it's all a gift, you know, when you're a part of something that's successful, whether it's a gangster movie or a horror genre film or a romantic comedy, it's a gift to be a part of something that the fans still want to see. So I'll take the gifts and uh, nourish them. You know, it was a very, very special time for horror when you were at the pinnacle of the Saw franchise, when you were the face of the Saw franchise, when you go from 5, 6 and then Saw 3D. You were competing against paranormal activity, it seemed, every Halloween. Was that something that was consciously talked about on set? Was that a conscious rivalry between you both? Because I remember every Halloween, I was like, I can't wait to watch the new Saw film and then the paranormal activity film the week after. No, you know, it wasn't conscious, but I remember something when the first paranormal activity came out, it did very well. And be years before that, Saw came out and did very well. So I guess everything is timing. And they were kind of both fresh entities in the world of movies. So, um, in a way, they, they independently compete, but not really. It's just they're trying to make the best movie they can. And how long can they sustain the storyline, 
and that particular sort of flavor of what they're doing. So you compete maybe in the box office, but you don't compete with the other movie because you still have to make the best film you can, you know? Did you watch those films as a fan when they were coming out, the Paranormal Activity films? No, no, I was just shocked at how great it was, and I think I saw some scenes, you know, and I'm an avid movie watcher of old movies, but I do catch up with the newer type movies on planes and stuff like that. So I eventually catch up with stuff, you know. And obviously you'll have no doubt watched the Saw films that you starred in. From when you entered the franchise, all the way up to your current legacy in it from Saw 10, what would you say are your top three favorite traps that you've seen in the franchise? In, uh, well, look, I have to say my favorite trap, selfishly, is the one that I escaped. Yeah, so grim. With my, yeah, <laughs> I got out of it, thank God, because I thought I was going on that one. Um, I, I do, I do relish, you know, I, I, I hate the, f I love the, the pendulum trap because it was to redeem my sister's death. But also, I was in a theater when I saw that trap yes. with 3,000 people in Vegas. And when it went to black after the guy got whatever he deserved for killing my sister, the audience went nuts. So the impact of that trap was huge as far as you got to feel what the cinema, what the audience erupts, you know, it's great. Um, and of course, there was Shawnee's uh, needle trap. I mean, there's so many good ones, it's crazy, but I guess the ones that are more personal are the ones that affect you more. I don't know how much of a horror fan you are yourself, but if you could have starred in, let's say, three other horror franchises, three iconic horror franchises, what would they be and why? Well, I'll always be dedicated to Saw because of Tobin's um, generosity and Mark Berg and Oren Kulis's generosity and the brilliance of... Uh, James Wong and um, and Lee Winnell, two young young guys from my hometown that did brilliantly. So I'll always be dedicated to them for somehow including me. But I'm I'm all about. I'd love to play the priest in The Exorcist and uh, another franchise of horror. You know, I, I the third one's the hardest to pick because there's so many to choose from. But The Devil's Rejects, something with a bunch of guys going through turmoil, would be good. Or maybe something like Damien, you know? The original ones were great. There wasn't a lot of trickery. I mean, The Exorcist blew me away, that's all I can tell you. Final one from me, and I've asked all the actors this question I've interviewed across the weekend and they've had a lot of fun with this. If you could host a dinner with five characters from the world of film or television, who would you pick and why? I'd pick Marlon Brando, Godfather character, for his wisdom. Yeah. I would pick, oh man, I would pick Willem Dafoe in um, the David Lynch movie because he was so weird and wonderful and it would be creepy to have at the dinner table <laughs> and I love Willem. Um, I would pick, and we're talking about horror, right? Yeah. Shit, eh. Uh, you can, you can give add me, a horror one in there. Uh, I would pick... Um, we have like Jason Voorhees or and he's not going to say a lot of Freddy Freddy Krueger's going to say a lot I, I, I'd invite Daniel Day-Lewis the butcher from uh, Gangs of New York yep. to see what he'd chop up for the table to eat and uh, I'd bring in Liam Neeson because he could handle everybody right Is the, and I'd bring in Denzel Washington because every character he does is impeccable and just for a little added flavour touch I'd bring in Mickey Rock just to be at the table because he's a beautiful actor and uh, he's done some unbelievable things. But to have all of these people at one table, and then you'd have the young ones, the Johnny Depps and the... Johnny Depp, who else? Tom Sizemore, he's not here anymore. Bring him for a laugh. I'd have to have about 15 of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a bit more than five, but it'd be a great dinner party, uh, wouldn't it? Unforgettable dinner. <laughs> Amazing. Well, as always, it's an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Always have so much. Question, I know it's a, it's a good one because it gets you thinking, and it's, I'm guessing that you've actually not been asked that before, which was no, the aim of that. I, I get greedy because I want. I'd probably invite five people from five different decades. Yeah, that's that's a good way to do it actually. Yeah. So it, it's fairly evened out, isn't it? Yeah. Because there's such brilliance through the years, you know, from from the Gil Brenner to Steve McQueen in the. Magnificent Seven, from Brando and Pacino and De Niro, exactly. Joe Pesci, who I love. There's so many great ones, you know. 
But to have a dinner in five different decades with five di memorable. Yeah. Amazing. Epic good luck. <laughs> really appreciate the time as always. Always love chatting to you, man.